Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. I know you thought I forgot about them, but this video is all about the Vietnamese. Now they are the last Civ to cover in my overview series, and also the last alphabetically, which was completely unintentional and not actually true, but it's pretty close. This is also coming out right around the four year anniversary of the channel, and in fact it might be hard to believe now, but over the last four years, the channel has averaged one overview every month and a half, and almost exactly one video per week. Getting back to the topic though, the Vietnamese are best characterized, I'd say, as an anti-archer archer civilization. In fact, as we'll see, your biggest problem when playing Vietnamese is actually having too many choices between ranged units. Let's check them out. To start things off, their team bonus is that they and their allies all get access to the Imperial Skirmisher. This is a final upgrade to the Skirmisher line, only available to Vietnamese and their allies for 300 wood and 450 gold. In terms of their stats, the difference is just one extra attack and pierce armor. But once you factor in a Vietnamese Civ bonus for extra archer and Skirmisher HP, they really start to look a lot more impressive than their generic counterparts. Of course, at late game market prices, the cost of the upgrade is the equivalent of about 49 skirmishers. So are they really that much better? The answer is, yeah. Against generic elite skirmishers with equal numbers, they end up with around half their HP left, and can stand toe to toe with generic units when outnumbered by five to four. In a long grinding post imperial game, that sort of value from a goldless unit could be the difference between slowly moving your map control forward or slowly falling back. It's also something your allies benefit from to a lesser extent as well, with a generic ally civilization also able to get some value. Of course, keep in mind in a team game there is also trade, and trash units like skirmishers aren't quite as common, but they are still seen now and then, especially with 300 or higher population limits. Of course, the fact it's a team bonus means it can interact with other civilizations' bonuses and techs in interesting ways, like the Aztecs getting extra attack and one more range, the Britons with again extra range, or Byzantines who get particularly good value by making them at a discount. Switching to the more hidden differences, they have slightly higher accuracy without thumbring than elite skirmishers, which might be useful for a civilization like Britons who don't normally have it. They also get one more bonus damage against a variety of archer units, and two extra damage against cavalry archers. Overall, they're not really an overpowering unit, as they are skirmishers after all, but are going to fill the same role as the elite skirmisher in a bit more cost efficient way over the long run for both you and your allies, making you a thorn in the side of any opponent whose civilization pushes them towards using a lot of archers. Moving on, their first civilization specific bonus is that they automatically reveal enemy positions at the start of the game. Normally, you just see your own team's town centers and have to guess your opponent's locations. Vietnamese have all of these starting locations revealed right away, with smaller circles around your enemies, helping you both predict what might come your way, as well as decide where to send your own early military units. I find this is most helpful on nomad maps, given how random starting locations can be. After a couple of minutes, the little kernels of your enemy's towns jump out like popcorn all over the map. Knowing enemy locations is obviously great for rushing, and lets you take a bit more time to scout out your own area of the map, but also feels a bit wasted on Vietnamese, given they otherwise don't have an early game economy bonus. The best thing you can do sometimes is forward the information to your allies, making it in fact more like a team bonus, with the inconvenient extra step of having to relay the information through flaring and chat. In fact, if it were up to me, I'd have flipped this and their team bonus, since this ends up working like a team bonus anyway, and also would have made the Imperial Skirmishers easier to balance, without needing to consider how other civilizations' bonuses interact with it. But at this point, I guess it is what it is. Another nice thing about knowing enemy town center locations is that you don't have to worry about running your scout right under them by accident. You could even argue that's another subtle bonus for your early game, given how important scouting information can be and how bad it can be to lose a scout early on. 
Moving on, their second Civ bonus is that their archery range units have 20% more HP. Up until the last patch, this was staggered and started at 10% in Feudal Age and worked its way up, but now they get the full effect right away. You can see how that changes the numbers for each archer unit, though notice it doesn't affect their unique unit. Seeing as this is your main military bonus throughout the game, you're sort of playing against your own civilization if you're not at least trying to incorporate archers to make use of it. The problem is archers are already a very low HP unit, and in an ideal situation they really shouldn't be taking a lot of damage anyway. In terms of ranged units they can fight, skirmishers already have a pretty significant bonus that quickly chews through the extra HP, to the point that archers are nowhere near cost effective. I find the largest impact is when you find yourself fighting against other archers, again reinforcing that anti-archer theme for the civilization. Against generic archers for example, their 20% HP bonus snowballs to around 30% of their HP left when against equal numbers in Feudal Age which is a pretty significant edge. Of course, it does also enable them to hold up against lots of other units throughout the game, surviving a bit better against mangonels and melee units. The third Civ bonus is free conscription, even if you don't have a castle. Conscription is an important Imperial Age tech that increases the work rate of your military buildings by 33%, except for siege workshops. In addition to training units, this also applies to upgrade and tech research rates. Now conscription itself is very strong and always worth getting in Imperial Age, but as a bonus, getting it for free is strictly speaking only worth 150 food and gold, plus one minute of castle work time. That could be nice if you regularly either forget to pick it up or don't happen to have a castle, making it one less thing you have to go out of your way for. You could also argue it gives a slight power spike in Imperial Age by letting you get some units out a bit faster, especially your first trebuchet. Making rattan archers or grabbing the elite upgrade in Imperial Age is also a bit easier since you save a bit of castle work time. As one of only three Civ bonuses though, I'd say it's a bit underwhelming and not something that really impacts how you'll play the civilization. So overall, looking at all of their Civ bonuses, I'd say the best way to make use of them would of course be to go with archers early on and transition into some combination later that still includes archers or skirmishers as well. You know what the civilization really needs though is some sort of ranged unit that's good against other archers. I just don't think we have quite enough of that yet. To be fair, you do have the higher HP archers, and I guess you have the best skirmishers in the game thanks to a unique upgrade, but somehow I just don't think we have the anti-archer thing fully covered yet. It turns out the devs were thinking right along the same lines, so let's move on and talk about their unique unit, the Rattan Archer. Now they cost 50 wood and 45 gold, which is a bit more than a regular archer, and also require a castle. But for that upfront cost, you end up getting a unit that's essentially a blend of an archer and a skirmisher. Their HP and attack are pretty similar to the regular crossbow line, but check out that Pierce Armor. I've tested them out in detail recently for a video against lots of different units, but basically their Pierce Armor makes them incredibly cost effective against all types of archers, except for the Chuko Nu, and they even hold up pretty well against skirmishers in a pinch, beating them with equal numbers. Even normally strong, unique units like longbows, plumed archers, and mangadai all do one damage per shot and are easily overwhelmed by rattans. They're upgraded by all of the regular archer upgrades, including thumb ring, which besides increasing their accuracy, also makes them reload about 16% faster. In terms of hidden stuff, they also have a bit of bonus damage against pikes, similar to the regular archer line, but nothing else that I could find. They're also particularly fast for archers, which helps them a lot in retreating from bad fights. One type of unit they will struggle against is anything with a lot of pierce armor and HP. The war wagon, for instance, beats them slightly with equal resources, and the Indian elephant archer with its own 9 pierce armor and 350 HP also wins easily with equal numbers and is about evenly matched when resources are balanced. Their biggest weakness though is to cavalry, since in that case they're basically crossbowmen, but more expensive, gaining little to no benefit from their extra pierce armor. If you are planning to make them, it's extra important to make sure you have something in front that can hold back melee units, or use a critical mass of them that can take out units like knights before they close the distance. 
They're also arguably countered less by mangonels than the regular archer line, given their one extra attack. That might not sound like much, but they end up doing 2 damage per shot instead of 1. Between that and their faster movement rate, I'd say they feel a little more threatening, even if they do have to get one tile closer to fire in Castle Age. So overall, they're like a more expensive version of the Archer, doing all the regular things an Archer can, but also excelling against other Archers and at resisting defensive buildings. In those cases, they're usually going to be worth the effort of building a castle and the extra wood cost. Considering everything so far has been so completely Archer focused, at this point you'll probably be looking for something tanky to put in front of them in order to soak up skirmisher shots or hold back those pesky melee units. It turns out Vietnamese also have a nice option for that, the Battle Elephant, which has helped out even more with their Castle Age unique tech, giving them an extra 50 HP. That's on top of their already very high HP to begin with, making them very well suited in their role as a meat shield in front of your excellent ranged units. The cost is pretty reasonable at 250 food and gold, and the main downside of the tech is that you need a castle first, so they're not as good as a civilization like the Khmer for elephant rushing, which have an automatic movement speed for free, or the Malay, which are automatically cheaper. Instead, for Vietnamese, they're more of a late game option to complement the archers you already have, as well as present at least a bit of a threat to buildings. To get a bit more technical, against pikes, another 50 HP means they can take 7 hits instead of 6, though either way, with equal numbers, they'll survive just fine. It's a similar effect for halberdiers in Imperial Age, which also take an extra hit, with 6 instead of 5. Again, not a huge effect, but also not significant either. It's the same story again for archers, against which they'll take an extra 17 arrows in both Castle Age and Imperial. Remember, they're also missing the last attack upgrade, further reinforcing the idea that they're specialized to be defensive rather than offensive units. Their second unique tech is one of the most unusual ideas I've seen. Basically, you pay 800 food and 200 gold, and 40 seconds later, you and all your allies get 500 gold back. I recently took a deeper look at this tech and how that compares to market prices. Basically, at its best, in a 1 vs 1, it's worth 188 extra gold, above what you'd get selling the food at the market. Though in a team game, it could be worth up to 1800 gold. Gold is less critical in a team game than 1 vs 1 because of trade, but that's still a solid one-time boost, and could help break up a stalemate or even kickstart a comeback. Add to that knowing the enemy starting locations, plus a unique team unit, and Vietnamese start to look designed as a team civilization that manages to help out in a lot of unconventional ways. So those are the Vietnamese unique unit and techs. Let's move on now and take a look at what they have available in their tech tree, starting with the archers. Early on, they have their HP bonus and know where their opponent's town center is, so you might think they'd be really good at rushing but you're still going to feel a bit slow without any sort of economy bonus. Once you get rolling though, you'll find they have a lot of choices, especially if you're going for something anti-archer. The big weakness here is the lack of hand cannoneer, making infantry and especially the Huskarl difficult to deal with. There's just so much competition for top tier archers, I feel like they settle into a very respectable but not quite overpowered A-. That puts them on roughly the same level as the Chinese and Ethiopians who got the same. Taking a look now at the infantry, they have no bonuses to speak of, and on top of that they're missing Blast Furnace. I'd still say they're serviceable and champions and halberdiers can still fill their normal roles, but overall it's a bit bland and maybe a middle of the road B-. Even missing a bit of late game attack, they still function perfectly fine as cheap filler units in front of your archers. Taking a look now at their cavalry, they have no significant bonus early, which means they're a bit weak right out of the gate and they're also missing Hazar and Paladin upgrades later. Again, they're also of course missing Blast Furnace. In their defense, they do have bloodlines for knights, and they're always tanky battle elephants. I feel like the C range is too low for having elephants as well as knights with bloodlines, so I'll go with a B-. It's certainly worth making a stable at some point, but they're a supplement to your army and not usually the focus. Checking out their Siege now, they do have Siege Engineers, which is always great, 
And the Bombard Cannon is also nice considering how many onagers you'll probably see countering your archers and elephants. The Heavy Scorpion would have been nice considering your lack of hand cannoneer as an anti-infantry unit, but overall you won't feel like you're missing anything critical. It's solid enough overall for a B, but nothing really stands out as special. Next up is the Navy. Early on it feels a bit anemic, or at least doesn't really stand out with any direct bonuses, though knowing where the enemy town centers are might help waste a bit less time hunting for dogs. The whole water triangle is available to you, so there's nothing really bad about it per se, and I'd go with a lackluster B- for the early game. It's kind of the same story in the late game as well. Bracer is good and you have a variety of units, only missing the fast fire ship, but again there's no real bonus to help give you a leg up. I'd say it's a B- again for the late game as well. Taking a quick look now at the monks, the big blemish I see right away is that there's no redemption, which is unfortunate since they otherwise have basically everything. That means no converting buildings or siege, though as a counter to knights or as something to heal your elephants, they'll still be pretty good. And speaking of having elephants, it's only natural that they would then be missing heresy as well. Overall, it's a passable B grade and the monks are certainly usable, but not really a specialty by any means. Checking out their defenses now, they're one of only three civilizations without the building HP upgrades. But other than that, it's a perfect set of university techs. All of the tower upgrades are there, and don't forget their free conscription, helping you pump out units in the early imperial age if you're under pressure. I can't quite get over missing masonry, since it's such a cheap tech with surprisingly good value, and they're also missing some nice counter units in the imperial age. But there's still lots to like here, and I'm gonna say it's a B for defenses. Finishing up the tech tree with the economy, the lack of an early game bonus means there's not a lot to talk about there. The tech tree looks good overall, especially in the late game, just missing gold shaft mining, which is arguably made up for with paper money anyway. It's a hard tech to factor in here since it's a one-time boost, and its effect depends on your number of teammates and the price of food at the market. I'd say it's a B-, considering the lack of an early bonus, but pretty solid late game. So just to wrap up with some overall impressions and ideas for strategies, they seem designed for an opening with, of course, archers. That makes use of both their extra HP bonus as well as their knowledge of the opponent's town center location. A bit of cavalry in the mid game to clean up skirmishers can be a good idea, but still crossbows and later on possibly rattan archers are what you're really being pushed toward. Your best late game units are also archers, so it makes sense to be investing your research in that direction throughout the game, as opposed to opening with scouts or knights and then making an abrupt transition to a different set of techs and upgrades. In terms of the big question of rattans, arbalests, or skirmishers, it really comes down to what you're up against and what your economy is set up to do. Rattans cost a bit more, but if you're against ranged units, that pierce armor is definitely going to pay off. On the other hand, if you're facing a lot of cavalry or infantry, you're not really making use of that pierce armor, so you're better off putting those resources into either arbalests or something else entirely. I'd also encourage mixing in a bit of siege with your army, especially the bombard cannon, giving you a threat against buildings, and more importantly, onagers, which archers and even elephants aren't great at handling. But that's really all I have to say about the Vietnamese. This is the last civilization to be covered, but I still intend to go back and fix up some of the old overviews that are a bit outdated, similar to what I did with the Japanese. You guys have been very helpful in pointing out which ones need the most attention, and if you have a request for which you'd like to see next, be sure to let me know. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you next time.